If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to the Epistle to the Galatians, chapter 3, excuse me, chapter 4. I better get the right chapter. The allegory of Hagar and Sarah. Now, what actually is an allegory? This series on biblical interpretation is going to take into consideration the different schools of interpretation and also errors in interpretation and then how to interpret correctly. The scripture says, rightly interpreting the word of truth. Everybody gets hold of the passage. All scripture is inspired by God. Profitable for doctrine, correction, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped to perform every good work. That's true. But how do you do it? The how is rightly interpreting the word of truth, which obviously means you can wrongly interpret. And it's not a question of opinion. On basic biblical doctrine, there are no multiple interpretations. Trinity, deity of Christ, virgin birth, vicarious atonement, bodily resurrection, second coming. You don't fool around with justification by faith and salvation by grace, or the existence of heaven and hell, or of eternal punishment. These are part and parcel of all the creeds of Christendom, which mirrors the teaching of the apostles and of the church fathers. The church fathers in the first five centuries reproduced the entire New Testament, so that if we lost the New Testament records, you could reproduce the entire New Testament from the writings of the first five centuries from the men who quoted it. Which gives you an idea of how deeply embedded in the Word of God they were. Interpretation was a very important thing. To make sure that when you told people something, it was consistent with what God said and God intended. Words are the vehicles of thought. Preserved in history, very much like a fossil that you can see in a museum. And you can see what a trilobite was by going to a museum and seeing it. You can see what the skeleton of a shark or a horse is by going into a museum and seeing the evidence fossilized. Language is fossilized for us in that words have a consistent meaning, but you always have to go to the culture and the time to find out their understanding of those words. When Wycliffe translators were translating various uh, cultures, uh, language of cultures, into biblical translation. They had some difficulty getting the equivalence in the language of the time. And when they came to the passage which says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. John 14. Nobody had any problem with that. The Greek word is kardios, which means heart. But it didn't mean the literal thumping muscle in your chest. Heart in the Jewish vocabulary, referred to the soul or the spirit, where you are. Where you are. Jesus said, where your treasure, where your heart is, there will your treasure be also. Or I should say, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So, if your treasure is on earthly things, your heart or your soul is tied to that. If it's tied to money and power, position, status, sex, patriotism, whatever it may be. If that's what it is, then that's where your soul is, resting beside it. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So heart was a synonym, cardios was a synonym for the spiritual nature of man. That's how the Jews understood it. But in the culture that Wycliffe was translating, the heart was not the symbol of where your spiritual nature is. Instead, it was the liver. Here. In some cultures, it's the Kidneys. Here. Well, how do you translate that so that people will get the message? So they got to this passage, let not your heart be troubled, and they found out it was the liver. How could you say, don't let your liver be troubled? I mean, that just didn't make any sense. So they ended up translating it, do not quiver in your liver. And they got the message immediately. Because whenever they felt queasy, it was their liver. Which, of course, your digestive system. When something happens, your digestive system goes off. So you get the whole area here, making you feel sick to your stomach or whatever it may be. They associate it with the liver. So do not quiver in your liver was John 14. 
Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Don't quiver in your liver. Do you see? In that culture, the words had a different connotation. I give you hundreds of illustrations of this in translation to show you. The basic idea is there. But how does the culture interpret that idea? That you've got to get into when you translate. Okay. An allegory, and I'm quoting now from Vine's Dictionary of Greek Words, is to speak not according to the primary sense of the word, but so that the facts stated are applied to illustrate a principle. I give it to you again. To speak not according to the primary sense of the words, but to speak so that the facts stated are applied to illustrate a principle. Last week I pointed out that you have a legitimate allegory here in Galatians chapter 4. Paul is talking about Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. And he says, tell me, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear or listen to the law? Verse 21. It is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was born from the slave woman was born after the desires of the flesh. Sarah thought she couldn't conceive a child. She was past the age of producing children. Abraham was still potent. She said, take a younger woman and fulfill what God promised. Now, she wasn't listening, because God said, I will be back, and Sarah will have a son. Remember that? I'll be back. And Sarah was in the other part of the tent, kitchen part of the tent. And she laughed scornfully. She chuckled. And she said, (laughs) and God says, you're laughing, not me. And God says, I have the last laugh. You're going to get pregnant. At 90? Right? But with God, nothing shall be impossible. So, she didn't believe him. Sarah was not a woman of faith. Abraham was a man of faith. Up to a point. So, he took Hagar, the slave woman, and their union produced Ishmael. Ishmael became a curse to Abraham and a curse to the Jews from that time on. Because Ishmael is the father of the Arabs. And the Arabs are the illegitimate seed of Abraham. And they are trying to take the land back again. So it's Ishmael and Isaac all over again in Israel right now. Ishmael and Isaac are fighting today as they were over 3,500 years ago. Still fighting. Why? The illegitimate child wants the birthright. So Paul uses that illustration. Listen. But he who was of the slave woman was born after the flesh, but the free woman after the spirit, by promise. In other words, God said, you're going to have a child. I want to keep my promise. Now, look at verse 24. These things are an allegory. Using our definition, we're not speaking according to the primary sense of the word. Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, and the children. These are only symbols so that the facts stated are applied to illustrate a principle. What is the principle? That the legitimate heirs of Abraham are the children of promise. The illegitimate are not. So it is necessary to recognize that position of authority in interpreting Scripture. Again, this is an allegory. For these represent two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which produces slavery. Hagar. Sinai represents the law. Which produces what? Slavery. Why? Because you can't keep it. That's why he begins by saying, tell me, verse 21, you who are under the law, do you not listen to the law? Don't you understand? You can't keep it. The purpose of the law was to reveal sin. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And Solomon says what? There is not a man that sinneth not. That's the wisest man that ever lived outside of Jesus Christ. God said so. He said, I gave you this wisdom, my wisdom. Solomon says, nobody can say, I don't sin. That's why... 
the old Methodist position, the Nazarene position, the extreme holiness position, which says that when you're born again and sanctified, you don't sin anymore. Really? You're smarter than Solomon. No, you're not. Solomon says, we know there is not a man or a woman that does not sin. What was the purpose of the law? Galatians 3. To reveal sin. To show you that you were lost. Back in the days when automobiles could only go 25 miles an hour. Nobody ever saw a road sign posted at 55. There's no need to put a 55 road sign up. Slow down. Because nobody could get there. God's trying to get a message across to you. The road sign is for the person that can get there. You aren't going to get there, says God. Because your engine won't take you to heaven. My grace will. So, you want to live under the law? Look out. Because the law wasn't given to produce life in you. The law was given to show you you were a lost sinner. So the covenant of law was to reveal sin, represented by Sinai. The covenant of grace is Jerusalem. So he develops this idea. Again, listen carefully. This allegory is of two covenants. The one from Sinai, which produces bondage, Hagar. Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is and is in slavery with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above all, is free. She is the mother of us all. God's Jerusalem is free. The ultimate covenant is grace, not law. Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that tra travailest not or labors not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which has a husband. Now we brothers, look at 28, here's your key to the allegory. We brothers, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. God promised the church in Jesus Christ to inherit eternity. To him it overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne. That's the promise. But, as then, he that was born after the flesh, Ishmael, persecuted him that was born after the spirit, Isaac. So now it is. We are the heirs of Abraham legitimately, and the Jews are not. Because they have rejected the Messiah, and they're persecuting us. This is all an allegorical statement. For the purpose of illustrating a principle. Law, grace, legitimacy, illegitimacy, salvation. Now that's the purpose of an allegorical presentation. To illustrate a spiritual truth in this context. Cast out the bondwoman, verse 30, and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free. We're free because of Jesus Christ. We have inherited Abraham's covenant. We are the children of promise. That's scripture. Jews and Gentiles are now the children of promise by the covenant of grace. Jerusalem is the symbol of that. The new Jerusalem. Now, once we see that, we can understand that there is a basic biblical usage of allegory. It's used to illustrate a spiritual principle. Let me show you how you can be totally led astray by allegorical interpretation. One of the greatest of all allegorical theologians was Philo of Alexandria. Philo got to Genesis chapter 2, verses 10 through 14, and he starts to allegorize. In these words, Moses intends to sketch out the particular virtues, and they also are four in number. Prudence, temperance, courage, and justice. So from the four rivers which flow from Eden, all right, he says, these really represent four branches. The greatest and single branch is generic virtue. So what flows out of Eden, the initial river, is generic virtue true virtue. This produces four other rivers or virtues. Prudence, temperance, courage, and justice. And the four particular virtues are branches from the generic virtue, which like a river waters all the good actions of each with an abundant stream of benefits. 
at the allegorical interpretation of Genesis chapter 2, verses 10 through 14, which has as much to do with those things as the price of eggs in Brazil. Nothing. What is he doing? He's reading into the passage, which is plainly literal, rivers, what each river represents. And he's giving an allegorical interpretation of it. Now, there's a real danger to allegorical interpretation and sometimes a real blessing. Where allegory follows biblical principles and is clearly allegorical. It illustrates a spiritual truth and it's very beneficial. In fact, Terry says, The allegorical method of interpretation is based upon a profound reverence for the scriptures and a desire to exhibit their manifold depths of wisdom. But it will be noted at once that its habit is to disregard the common significance of words and give wing to all manner of fanciful speculation. I'll say, the four rivers which are named in Genesis end up as four virtues flowing from a generic virtue river. Nothing whatsoever to do with the fact. But it can be true and yet not flow from a biblical statement. The danger of allegorical interpretation is that you are quite liable to get wound up in the language and forget the meaning of the term. There are two terms I've tried to pronounce here repeatedly for the class. Exegesis and eisegesis. Exegesis is to take out of the text what it says in context and according to its grammar and what else is involved anywhere in Scripture dealing with the same subject. That is to exegete. To eisegete is to read into the text what you want it to say or what you think it says, which is exactly where the faith teachers, exactly where the cults, exactly where heretical theology originates. It is reading into something what it plainly does not say. That's why I gave you the illustration of the concept of the tongue being a force of good and evil. In other words, you confess something with your tongue that's negative, you get it. You confess something that's positive, you get it. That's the positive confession or faith teaching on this subject. But actually, the passage which says the power of life and death are in the tongue isn't talking about that at all. It's talking about the fact that your life is lived by what you say. And the power of living or dying often is in your mouth. has nothing to do with confessing your new Mercedes in the driveway, your Maserati or your new condominium or trip around the world, and then God giving it to you. Or, as I once said to Frederick Price when we were talking, I said, if Christian Research Institute could be of any help to you, if you have any problems at all with the cults or anything, please call on us. He stopped right in his tracks, looked at me and said, I don't have any problems. We don't have any problems. I said, you mean it's a negative confession to admit that you have a problem? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. So they can't ever confess anything negative. Only what's positive, because if you confess something negative, you get it. You know where Frederick Price got that? He doesn't even know. He got it from Mary Baker Eddy. And from Ernest Holmes. And from the mind science cults, who tell you exactly the same thing. You confess error, you get error. You confess evil, you get an evil spirit. That's Mrs. Eddy. Long before Freddie Price was born. So, by taking a passage out of context... By ignoring the plain meaning of language, you end up with a doctrine which is completely removed from Scripture. That's what Gordon Fee was telling us when he spoke of the disease of the health and wealth gospel. Watch what you're reading. Watch what you're being told something says. Because most times, a text out of context is a pretext. And I add to that a pretext for heretical or false teachings. So here's a legitimate allegory in Galatians 4. Illegitimate allegory, Genesis chapter 2. Now what happens with the liberal theologians is that they proceed to take allegory and reduce the Bible to mythology. So that Genesis is nothing but an allegory on creation. And that Adam really isn't a person or Eve. They represent generic humanity. 
And therefore, by believing this, you do away with all of the critical problems of Genesis. The morning and the evening were one day, six literal days. They do away with all of that. Because they have spiritualized the text. If you want to make a note on this, this is it. Allegorization is spiritualization. Allegorization is spiritualization of a text. So if it isn't warranted in the text, you don't try and use it. Otherwise, you have nothing but false doctrines. How many times have I turned on TBN and watched Roy Blizzard giving illustrations from the Old Testament? A lot of them allegorical interpretations where language is concerned. Trying to show a link between the Old Testament and the New Testament, which is in no way connected. But he connects them. And it's exactly what the faith teachers do. They connect things that are not connectable. You know the old Negro spiritual? The hip bone connected to the thigh bone, the thigh bone connected to the back bone. Remember that? Yeah. Well, when you get into eisegesis, the thigh bone is connected to the foot bone. And the toe bone is connected to the backbone. And you get a malformed monster. And you can't tell what the text says. Now, there are places where allegorical interpretation is valid. I just gave one. But if you try and use allegory all the time, or that method all the time, you corrupt what the scripture says. The first man, Adam, was a living soul, says the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 15. He there says that Adam is a living being, an historical person, the first man, Adam. Today, what we get is that Adam is a picture of all mankind. And that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was simply the power of choice. And that the serpent was really a symbol of evil that tempts man, not necessarily a person. By the time they get finished, an allegorical interpretation of the Garden of Eden, it could be McDonald's on Monday morning. It has no relationship to the language at all. Now you say, well, you're making a big point of this. Yes, because I'm a professor of hermeneutics, along with the other fields in which I teach. I taught hermeneutics for six years, specifically to pre-divinity students, to help them not get confused. It's very important to understand what type of interpretation you can use. It's very important to know whether something is metaphorical or it's a simile. It's very important to understand what different schools of interpretation say because that saves you from their mistakes. Next week, we're going to go into how those mistakes spill over from the seminary to the minister and into the pew. And you can see why people are confused today. They're very confused. Why? Because they're not getting any consistent biblical interpretation. They're getting fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man, and neighborhood of Boston. They're getting whatever the local preacher says this passage means. That's why I've tried to drill into my classes for years this terribly important principle. Test all things. Hold fast to what's good. You will never know if I'm telling you the truth or not if you do not test it by Scripture. Now, I want to teach the truth. I don't want to make mistakes. I'm responsible for mistakes that you make if you believe what I say. But so are you if you believe what I say without checking what God said. There is a dual responsibility. Where I'm consistent with Scripture, obey. Where I'm not, correct me. Because it's terribly important that the body of Christ gets sound doctrine. And you cannot get sound doctrine with corrupt methods of interpretation. Impossible. I'll never forget a classic illustration of this. One day, I'm looking at my television set, which I rarely have a chance to do. And on comes Frederick Price, preaching from Crenshaw Christian Center. So I said, well, I have a few minutes, I'll watch. He has a big Bible in his hand, biggest King James I ever saw. And he's walking back and forth in front of the audience. He says, there are some people who are teaching that you keep on asking God and keep on seeking from God and keep on pounding on the gates of heaven in order to get answers to your prayers. 
That's not necessary. All you have to do is believe God and confess this and trust God to do this. God's given promises. He says, now there's a passage of scripture I'd like to refer to. I said, this is going to be good. And it was. He turned to a member of the audience and said, uh, somebody have a, a, a modern translation here instead of the King James. One brother raised his hand. I have, Pastor. He said, would you read it? I brought the microphone over to him. And he reads it. And Jesus said, Luke 11, Keep on asking and you will receive. Keep on seeking, you will find. Keep on knocking, it will be opened. I wish I had a photograph in Polaroid or Freddie Price's face. He had just finished saying, Don't do this. Don't do this. And to emphasize it, he wanted a modern translation. And the modern translation was absolutely accurate. The tense in the Greek was perfect. Jesus did say, you want something? Keep asking. You're seeking? Keep looking. You want the door to be open? Keep knocking. And he changed gears so fast. Well, I'll over this other passage over here. Boop, over another passage. What happened to that passage? That passage contradicted what he said word for word. That is the product of faulty hermeneutics. That is the product of a lack of exegesis. That is the product of an evangelist trying to be a theologian. Doesn't work. Chiropractors make lousy brain surgeons. And you don't go to them for brain surgery. You don't go to tele-evangelists for biblical theology. You should go to the Word of God, to Christian teachers, to your pastors, and to those that have the authority for the teaching ministry of the church. That's why hermeneutics is important. It's a big word. You know what it translates to? Making sure. Making sure that what you read really says that. And what you tell somebody really is exactly what God said. If you walk out of this room this morning, and I'm going to close with this. You say, Walter Martin says, could be wrong. I'm fallible. I make mistakes like everybody else. My wife is here this morning. She'd be happy to give you a catalog. A large, increasing catalog of my errors. We all make mistakes. We all make misinterpretations. We all fail somewhere. And I'm a teacher. I'm more held responsible for this than you are. That's what James tells me. You walk out of here and say, Walter Martin says this, Walter Martin says that. He could be wrong. You check what I said. You can say, God said that. It's right there. And we got that in our Bible class this morning. I learned something. I was instructed from the Word of God. By somebody faithful to the Word of God. Hopefully, always. But it doesn't rest on what I think or what I say. It rests on whether or not it corresponds with Scripture. If I could put one word in your minds this morning, it would be this. Correspondence. The correspondence of what you hear and what you read with what God said. If I make a mistake, that's one thing. But God doesn't make any. And when He speaks in these areas, we are His spokesmen. We are ambassadors for Christ. If you were going to present your credentials to a foreign court, and you were a designated ambassador of the United States of America... I think you would be very, very careful about what you said and what you quoted and how you represented your country. Why? Because you are the representative, designated representative. If you're going to be that careful about your country, you jolly well better be careful about the kingdom of God because you are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And when you present your credentials, they had better square with Scripture. Not with what some tele-evangelist or Bible teacher or pastor or anybody else said. What God said. Paul said, be followers of me as dear children as I follow Christ. I said the same thing. As I follow Christ. The Word of God. It is very important what God says. You can lose your soul not understanding what he says. You can gain immortality by obeying what he said. It is therefore very important to know what he said. 
schools of interpretation take on very great importance when you realize how many people have lost their souls because they didn't understand. So let's us concentrate on that this morning. What the text says, what its meaning is in context, what the language says, and how do I apply that to my life? If God says to you, Thou shalt not commit murder. You understand that very clearly. And you obey it. Why? Because it's very clear that God frowns on murder along with the state. How about looking at it this way? God said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And thy house. That's important. That's the message of life. That's part of the credentials of the kingdom of heaven. And with it goes one more credential. He that believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he that will not obey the Son will not ever see life. But the wrath of God continues to abide upon him. Those are awesome credentials, fearsome truths. The savor of life and the savor of death. And you and I are ambassadors of that message. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That is the kingdom of heaven. It hasn't changed in 2,000 years. It never will. The science of biblical interpretation is to help us understand that and then to communicate it to a thirsty world. Whoever has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit says. And obey. Our Father, we worship you. The only source of life. Immortality. Eternal glory. We thank you for Jesus Christ, who on Calvary paid the price for our sins. Wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The payment for our sins rested on him with his suffering. We have been healed. Oh, how we thank thee that thou hast spoken plainly, Lord. So that even the wayfaring man and the stranger cannot possibly misinterpret. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. Breathe upon us with thy Holy Spirit. Teach us this this morning. If there be any person here that does not know the Lord Jesus as their Savior, give them neither rest nor peace until they shall make their peace with thee. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open them to the Gospel of John, chapter 3. We continue with our study on interpretation of the Bible. This morning, I'd like to touch on some ground I have touched on before and then move on to one other thing. One of the most important things in the study of Scripture is grammar and the root and meaning of words. Words change their meaning. I think probably the best way to demonstrate that is an example given by D.A. Carson, a very fine biblical scholar, in a book entitled Exegetical Fallacies. And in that book, he points out that the word martyr, M-A-R-T-Y-R, underwent some very consistent change throughout history over, literally, 2,000 years. The first meaning of the word in the Greek, which was martus, which we translate in our word martyr, was one who gives evidence in or out of a court of law. That was the original root meaning of the word. One who gives evidence in or out of a court of law. As time went on, it was one who gives solemn witness or affirmation of one's faith. As time went on, it became one who witnesses to personal faith, even in the threat of death. Then it became one who witnesses to personal faith by the willingness to accept death. And it finally ended up one who dies for a cause, a martyr. Now here are five stages. The root and four others. And it shows how words change their meaning and how you get what is called semantic obsolescence. That is, a word becomes obsolete in its original meaning 
And then you have to continuously see how the word has changed according to context and culture. I think it's very significant that when we study the New Testament, we sometimes get hung up on words. And I get questions on this all the time. Grammar is a very important thing. But grammar without context, grammar without comparison to other texts, can become very hazardous. For instance, there are books out on word studies of the New Testament. That's really the study of what is called etymology. That's part of hermeneutics or biblical interpretation. Etymology. The study of the meaning or roots of words. Yes, they're important. But when you have a word study, independent of the usage of the term through history, independent of the context in which the word appears, and independent of its usage generally at that time when that was written, then you get into obsolescence. I've heard people preach stirring messages on semantic obsolescence without even realizing that they're doing it. And Dr. Carson has some interesting observations on this. In John chapter 3, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should never perish but have eternal life. King James Bible translates the Greek word monogenes, only begotten son, from the Greek root genos, G-E-N-O-S, which means, in its basic meaning, root, stock, breed, kind, or type. That's its basic root concept. So when they got to John 3, very learned scholars, commentators, spoke of Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son of God. The Arian heretics came along in the 3rd century, following Arius of Alexandria, a heretic, and they said, if Jesus Christ is monogenes, he is the only one created in a unique way, generated, genos. So they taught that Jesus Christ was a second God generated by his Father who was the first God. All that from one Greek word, monogenes. You say, well, what has that got to do with us today? Well, I'll tell you what it's got to do with you today. The people that are the descendants of the Arians are the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they are coming into your living room and onto your doorstep telling you that Jesus Christ is a created being, monogenes, only begotten Son of God. And he's really Michael the Archangel who became the Redeemer, but he is uniquely a creature. Now, in John 3, the word monogenes appears. And it is translated only begotten. That is an incorrect translation. It's incorrect from the word's usage. It's incorrect from its context. But the actual meaning of the word is only generated, monogenes. That's the root. But it changed. Your new international version. Who has a new international version here this morning? All right. Read me John 3.16 in the international, new international version. Ah. We got it. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. But the angels are called the sons of God in the book of Job, are they not? Is not Adam called the son of God? Certainly, in Luke. Are we not called, beloved now are we the sons of God? It does not yet appear what we shall be. We know when he appears we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. Well then, what in the world are we talking about here? His one and only son. Answer. The meaning of the word is unique son. One of a kind. Jesus Christ is one of a kind. One of a type. He is unique. That's why the French translation of John 3, long ago, got it right. He is the unique Son of God. How is He unique? He is the only one 
who actually partakes of the nature of his father. He is the only one who shares eternity with God as the word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's his uniqueness. God actually appearing in human flesh. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only, his unique son, that whoever believes in him should never perish but have everlasting life. Then, because of this, John chapter 1 takes on a new meaning. No one has ever seen God, John 1.18, at any time but the one and only Son, the unique, one-of-a-kind Son. He has revealed him. No one, Jesus said, knows the Father but the Son, and no one knows the Son but the Father. And you cannot know the Father unless the Son reveals him to you. He is the revealer of the invisible God. He is the reflection and image of God himself in human flesh. And he's more than that. He's the nature of God himself in human flesh. Hebrews chapter 1. You see how important it is to tie the verses together? Hebrews chapter 1. God, who at different times and different ways in times past spoke to our fathers and the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us in his Son, whom he appointed the inheritor of all things through whom he created the universe. Now listen carefully. This is his uniqueness. The radiance of the glory of God. The word effulgence, the outshining of the Shekinah of Yahweh Elohim. That's who the Son is. He is the blinding blast of the glory of God, masked in human flesh. He is the character, upastasios tes character. He is the nature and character of God himself stamped into human flesh. Monogenes is unique. How is he unique? He is uniquely God, uniquely deity, uniquely eternal. Not begotten, monogenes, but one of a kind, the one and only Son. This is derived from the Old Testament passages from the Hebrew word yachid, which tells us about being alone, the unique one of a kind. And finally in Hebrews 11, chapter 17, where Isaac is called Monogenes, the only begotten son of Abraham, the unique son of Abraham. Well, he wasn't the only begotten son of Abraham. Abraham had other children by Keturah. Is that not true? Genesis 25? Is it not true that Abraham had an illegitimate child? Before Isaac, that that child's name was Ishmael? Yes. Then how can the writer of Hebrews call him only begotten? If you take the word to mean only generated, it falls apart. It actually means Isaac is the unique son. Why is Isaac the unique son of Abraham? He is the one of a kind who came by what? Promise. So, once you put Hebrews 11.17 together with John 3.16 and John 1.18, the meaning of monogenes, translated only begotten, changes. It is not the only one generated. It is the unique one of a kind. As Isaac is one of a kind, Jesus Christ is uniquely God and man, one of a kind. Now, there are lots of other illustrations of this. I wish we had the time to go into them. I'm going to give you three that will make it very clear how you can avoid the fallacy of what is known in hermeneutics as semantic anachronism. How do you like that for a 50-cent word? Semantic is linguistic. Anachronism, you ought to know. Something that's out of its historical order. Semantic anachronism. Romans 1.16. 
I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. How many pastors have you heard preach on the dynamite of God? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the dunamis of God. Pastor gets up there. He says, this word dunamis, this word is actually the root word for our word dynamite. And Jesus Christ's gospel is the dynamite of God. That's an anachronism. That's a semantic jungle. It doesn't mean that at all. The word has totally changed its meaning. What we've done is to take a contemporary meaning of dynamite and read it back into the Greek word dunamis. Dynamite blows everything apart. That's not the intent of Romans 1.16. For Paul... The gospel isn't the TNT that blows everything apart. For Paul, it is the power of the resurrection. In other words, the empty tomb. Jesus Christ came out of the tomb. It's empty. The power of God is out in the world. Doing what? Transforming the lives of people. Not blowing them apart. How many preachers get up there and preach on this semantic anachronism? Reading back into it the word dynamite. Forget it. The word dynamite won't fit. That's what happens when you abuse grammar and etymology. Etymology is a 50-cent word, which means the origin of words. I was once in East Rutherford, New Jersey, at the headquarters of a cult. The cult is called the Dawn Bible Students. They have a program on radio and television called Frank and Ernest, where two guys talk frankly and earnestly. I talk to them. They are neither Frank nor Ernest. They're deceivers. But Frank and I had a nice chat. And Frank said to me, you believe in eternal punishment. I said, that's right. He says, don't you know that the root meaning of the word for punishment isn't torture? It's to test you. He said, it's from the Greek word which means touchstone. And I looked at him for a moment and I said, so what? He said, well, if it's a touchstone or a test, it has nothing whatever to do with punishment. That's semantic acronism in which you are reading into it an old meaning that's gone. The word changed just like martyr did. And it ends up in the book of Revelation as the wrath, orges, and thumos, and judgment of God, and they that reject the gospel, says John, will undergo eonion besonhaizontai, the same word as in Matthew chapter 25. Eternal punishment. Everlasting, never-ending punishment. The word changed its meaning. But people read things into it in order to escape the idea of the word. Second illustration. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. God loves a cheerful giver. He does. And I've joked with you sometimes by saying, actually the Greek word is hilaron, from which we get our word hilarious. And I kid you by saying, the Lord loves a hilarious giver. I do not mean by that that we should play a laugh track at, at offering time. What I mean is, the attitude of the heart is to be based on love and out of devotion to Christ. And that when you give, you should give that way. Now, you notice I'm speaking on this text after the offering, so you cannot claim that I'm reaching for your pocketbook. <laughs> the offering's been taken. But how many preachers get up there and really seriously preach, not jokingly as I do, really seriously preach, you should give hilariously with reckless abandonment. Oh, it's awful. That's not the meaning at all. Obviously, the meaning has changed. We're taking the meaning here, hilarious, and reading it back into the Word and saying, there we are, that's it. No, that's a semantic anachronism. We're reading it back. That's not what the Word means. The Word is actually telling you to give out of a heart dedicated in love and devotion and with an attitude of 
cheerfulness. In other words, willingness to give. The Lord loves a willing attitude of giving. There's a third one. In Christianity today, 1983, they ran a series of articles, which Dr. Carson got very upset about, and after I read it, I understood why, in which they were talking about the miraculous power of blood and how the blood of Jesus Christ can be understood in the light of our modern knowledge of hematology, which is the science of blood analysis. You go into a hospital and you see a sign on the wall that says, Hematology Department. What are they talking about? Blood. So Christianity Today published three articles and spoke about the miraculous cleansing power of blood. Just as blood flushes out cellular impurities and transport nourishment to every part of the body, so the blood of Jesus Christ does this in your life. What? The blood of Jesus was red and white corpuscles, hemoglobin and plasma. He was a normal human being. John MacArthur is right when he points out that we have become so obsessed with the term blood in the New Testament that we have forgotten the actual meaning behind it. The meaning behind red and white corpuscles, hemoglobin and plasma is sacrifice. Jesus Christ sacrificed his life on the cross for you and for me. We lay claim to that by faith. We are cleansed by the sacrificial death of Jesus who died in our place and the blood is the symbol of the sacrifice. We, however, have shifted over so that the blood itself, forgetting what it represents, absorbs our thoughts. For instance, how many times have you heard people say, we've got to plead the blood. Plead red and white corpuscles, hemoglobin and plasma. That's what blood is. They don't really mean that. What they really mean is, Jesus died and the merits of his sacrifice we plead before God. Isn't that right? When you get down on your knees, you say, Lord Jesus, because of what you did for me on the cross, you shed your blood for me, you died in my place, I come into your presence. That's how you talk to God. You know perfectly well if you stop and think about it, you are not talking about hemoglobin and plasma and corpuscles. You're talking about what it represents. Dr. Carson points out, and I quite agree, that Jesus Christ accomplished by his death, he achieved by his death on the cross, our justification. He achieved by his death on the cross, our redemption. He achieved by his death on the cross, our resurrection. The blood was the symbol of God's triumph. Red and white corpuscles, hemoglobin and plasma are the same as ours. But the life was different. The life that was sacrificed on the cross was the life of God in human flesh. Therefore, one drop of his blood was worth more than all the hemoglobin, corpuscles, and plasma in the entire history of the world because it represented the exchange of the perfection of God for the imperfection of man. That's why it's valuable. Now, don't sit here and say, Walter Martin doesn't believe in the blood of Jesus. Walter Martin lives under the blood of Jesus, which is the symbol of God's sacrifice for my sins. If I were not covered by that sacrifice, if you were not covered by that sacrifice, we would be eternally lost. But let's not become so absorbed with the vehicle of redemption that we forget the essence of redemption. And the essence of redemption was the life of God which was exchanged for your life and my life on the cross. I like this statement from Dr. Carson. I'm going to close with it. He says, if John tells us that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ purifies us from every sin, he is informing us that our hope for continued cleansing and forgiveness does not rest on protestations of our goodness, 
while our life is a sham. But on a continual walking in the light and on continued reliance on Christ's finished work on the cross. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, keeps on cleansing us from all sin, could easily be translated. And the sacrifice, the offering of Jesus Christ, God's son, keeps on cleansing us. The benefit of what he did on the cross. He presented in heaven his own blood. What does it mean? Did Jesus actually take five quarts of hemoglobin and red and white corpuscles into heaven itself, into a literal tabernacle and sprinkle them on the mercy seat? Or is this a figure of Jesus Christ rose from the dead and presented himself alive in heaven with the merits of his sacrifice for our sins. He paid the price for it all. We have a danger in forgetting semantic anachronisms. We have a danger in absorption with grammar. We have a danger in digging into word studies, ignoring context and historic usage. There is a danger, even a heretical danger, of being led astray when we are terribly sincere, but we're not doing our homework. Am I against word studies? Oh, no. Vincent's word studies? Excellent. Vine? Excellent. Robertson? Excellent. I use them myself. They're great. But they're scholars who tie it all together so you don't get these errors. I don't expect you to become exegetical scholars. That takes a long time. But through this series of messages, I want to acquaint you with the things you can avoid and thus increase the capacity for learning and for appreciation of the Word of God. And also to show you why evangelists and why people who don't do their homework can get you in an awful lot of trouble. Even writing in Christianity today, if you don't know how to test it, and you don't know what to look for. Next time you hear John 3.16, remember what it really means. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only unique son that whoever believes in him should never perish but have eternal life. The message of redemption never changes. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Sanctify us through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. Our Father, we worship you, praising you and thanking you for the Lord Jesus and for Calvary. Lord, these are very deep things that we go into in terms of the meaning of thy word, and of words themselves, which are vehicles of thought. We ask you in Jesus' name to guide and guard us, to instruct us in the sanctity and the sacredness of thy word, so that we may approach it as Moses approached the burning bush, removing his feet, his shoes, because we are on a holy ground. O oh God, our Father, bless thy word to our hearts and to our minds. Cleanse us of our sins. Make us vessels fit for thy usage. Give us a deeper appreciation, a keener understanding of thy word. In the name of thy son, Jesus, we ask with thanksgiving. Amen.